Today I will give like an intro of the basic uh, about optics, fluids, and electronics. That is, yeah, a part that sometimes we don't put too much attention because we think, you know, we put more attention in panel design and other things that are also very important. But I think knowing the basic always gives us a lot of, of tools to face uh, different things that you encounter when preparing uh, an experiment that includes flow cytometry. Um, so I will start just mentioning that a flow cytometry is it's a summatory of many parts. As you may know, it's composed of, of fluidics, right? We have also light sources, it's usually solid state laser, they're usually small, very compact. In the past, we were using very big lasers based on gases like um, argon and crypto, krypton, but right now we use a small laser that we could fit in, in into a small instrument. We also have filters, um, all the detectors, named PMTs or avalanche photodiodes. And we also have computers that have, um, display the data that we observe when we do an experiment. Um, these kind of elements are organizing what I call systems. So we have fluidic system that basically transfer the cells uh, to a device named flow cell in which cell basically meet the lasers. We also have the part of the optics that includes the laser beam and also all the detection system that basically collect the photons that come from this interaction between laser and particle. And we also have the part of the electronic that basically presses the signal and then allow us to visualize the data on the computer of that decision so far. Mm. Let me a little bit, maybe I'll do a quick change of my view. That's fine. Um, so the first part that we also mentioned, the fluidics. So any flow cytometer is built around the principle of transporting the cells to the interrogation point by creating a stable stream. You know, fluidics are, by definition, very resistant to be compressed but you could force them to go through a small exit by applying pressure like air, for example. And once they go to a small exit, um, then if you keep the same uh, pressure, if you keep a constant pressure, what you will create is a laminar flow. Um, the speed profile of the laminar flow is depending on the friction. So there is, of course, a lot of friction happening in the wall of the vessel that contain the fluidics. Um, also depend of course of the viscosity of the fluidics, but at the end, the particle will usually move to the center, but there is of course less resistance. And in this center will then reach a highest speed profile. Um, in a laminar, in a flow cytometry, the laminar flow is generated in something we name cuvet flow cell. It's, it's kind of the main device we, we found in, in an analyzer. In cell sorter, we also have jet in air system, but when it comes to analyzer, we usually talk about cuvette or flow cells. And what is happening is the flow cell has uh, this laminar flow occurring and the sample is, that is then injected into the system. Uh, what we have here in, in the cartoon, it's, it's just um, the laminar flow occurring in blue. You see the blue arrows? I think you can see my, my mouse, of course. And then we have this, the sample getting into this laminar flow that is already generated in the system. The question is how to inject the sample. And in this case, the answer will be to also pressurize the sample. So we add a pressure into the samples and the particles that are present in this tube are then transporting and kind of injected into the, into the laminar flow itself. And we also have a pressure into the chip fluid. So they, they are both pressurized, but there is a differential pressure of more or less 0.2 or 0.5 PSI. So they don't get to mix between them. And what we have is, is they will be run, running together and the chip fluid will be all around the sample. And what, what it does is then, so it press basically the sample and the particles present in the sample itself to generate like a system in which every particle is going by one by one into the system and then getting illuminated also one by one. Uh, if we cut this longitudinal and imagine like something round in which everything around is just fluid and in the center we have the sample, we call it sample core. And this is something very important um, 
when you have the option to push a bit the, the, the amount of sample that you put into the system. I don't know if you have, I'm thinking about the forte sign, which you have low, medium, and high. No, and sometimes people push very, you know, you push high because you want to process sample very quick. Sometimes you, you need to, I don't know, acquire one million of cells for the phenotypic characterization of this very rare population. So what you want to push is a lot of sample. And in some cases it's fine, but in other cases, if you push more sample, what you make is then a sample core get wider and instead feeding only one cell, you feed a lot of cells. So at the moment that the cells get illuminated, then not only one particle is illuminated by several one are illuminated at the same time. And I say it again for phenotypic analysis, this is totally okay. But when it comes to analysis, like for example, um, cell cycle in which you have you know, a histogram, where you have G1, S2, or when you have proliferation, in which you want to see very, very narrow peaks, that is actually not a good idea. So you need to always keep into account that in some cases you could be flexible with some things, like the amount of sample you push, but for other applications, you really need to take this into account. So the advice here will be, if you have things like cell cycle or proliferation, do not push a lot of sample into the system. For cell cycle, we usually do something like 200 events per sec, same for proliferation, and although it will take longer, the quality of the data um, will be always better. Um, coming back to so what is happening in the flow cell is that you have, again, the cheese fluid pushing the sample. We call it hydrodynamic focus because basically the cheese fluid literally push uh, the cells and focus the cell in a way that then only one by one are passing and only one cell will be eliminated at, at a given time. Um, so I just put it the other way around because we always imagine the flow cell like this, no? But it's always the other way around. So you have the sample injection core. Again, I'm thinking about a BD system in which you have usually the needle, the, the seat, the sample injection core. The cells are going up and then you have the flow cell and everything is happening more above than, than the other way around. Mm, this is just like a cartoon showing like a simplified scheme of, of how is the fluidic system. So you usually have this chip tank that contain the chip fluid that is no more than PVAs and some bacteriostatic uh, compounds to so avoid contamination. This chip fluid is pressurized, then it's um, basically injected into the flow cell. And on the other side, you have also pressure coming into the tube that then make the cells transport the cells also again into the flow cells where this interaction laser particle is happening. Once cells are analyzed, they go directly to the waste. No? In, in the case of a cell sorter, it will be different. Then we will have the option to actually collect the particles, but in an analyzer, whatever is analyzed, it goes directly to the waste. And then you have, of course, a waste tank. Um, something really simple um, that will happen uh, when you become a user, I guess most of you are like or new or maybe some of you are already quite experienced or people that stay, you know, delayed in the lab acquiring samples that I think is happening um, to most of them at some point. Um, most of the thing what you have problems into a system, if you, for example, load YouTube but you don't see anything, People tend to think that it's a big problem, that, oh, there is a laser that is dead, or there is a detector that is not working. Think too simple. One of the main problems that you could have in an instrument is always related to the fluidics, or most of the time is related to the fluidics and relate to a problem in, in the flow, in the laminar flow. That maybe the laminar flow is not happening. There are some turbulence in the system. Cells might be, you know, losing uh, the time delays, or it could be really many things related to the fluidic system. So also small advice in, in this point is um, always make sure to clean the instrument before and after usage because that will improve a lot your, your experience in front of the cytometry, especially if you are at midnight running your sample. And when it comes here to the pressure, um, sometimes people get freak out when they load the tube and they don't see events. One of the things you also need to verify quickly as a very, very first thing is it's just the state of the tube. If you have a small crack into the tube, the system won't be able to create pressure and you won't see anything. And it's possible that the instrument is perfectly, you know, is working perfectly and it's just a little problem at this point. 
Uh, some other instruments use uh, peristactyl pumps, you know? so they, they actually literally soak the sample. They don't build up a pressure into the tube, but instead they soak the samples. I think the Attune uh, instrument does it, um, that Curry also does it, so you could have different formats. You could even load an Ependor tube, and the Ependor could be just loose into the sample injection port. But in some systems, like for example, again, the Foxcando or uh, the classical Forte style, have to analyze it. You need to build up a pressure into the tube. So always take into account this small detail. So after passing this part of the fluidic system, uh, we need to start incorporating all parts like optics. Um, what we will have here is basically once the cell are already inside this laminar flow, then they will be illuminated by, by a laser beam. Um, and that's what we call interrogation point. So it's, it's just this moment in which cell or particle meets the laser or laser source. And then the cytometer have um, some detector to collect how the particle is carried the light and also all the fluorescent signal coming from this interaction. Uh, so basically, I think I have another slide that I could start talking about the forward scatter that is placed in the same axis of the laser. That is also what we call a blocking bar in front of the detector, because of course the laser will cross the cells. So we also need to block the signal coming directly from the laser. So that's what we place, or cytometer have placed the blocking bar. And at 90 degree of the laser beam, we will always have the side scatter and all the fluorescent detectors. I think this is explained better in this slide, in which again, we have the laser source. No? That is a laser that illuminates a particle. Uh, at, at this level, you have uh, light that is getting scattered uh, in different direction. Forward, it's what we call kind of the main detector. And it's, it's basically collecting the light that is scattered in an angle between 10 and 18 degrees. And we have another set of detectors that I located at 90 degrees uh, regarding the laser beam here. And this is the one that is collecting the side the scatter and also all the fluorescent signals. Um, so at this point of the interaction, what we will have is light getting scattered, and also if the sample have fluorescent itself, and we will have a lot of cycle of fluorescence or excitation emission that will happen in this moment. Uh, these first two signal, I have to say, forward. From what we call the triggering laser, that is usually the blue, that is the very first laser illuminating a particle. Mm. Now, as we go a bit more into the notion of what this was information could, get, could we get out of the forward and the side scatter signal. Um, by definition, forward scatter measure, the light that is scattered by the particles, and it has to do also with the size of the particle. No, but that's, that's what we have learned in every close cytometry course. Forward is always related to the size, and the side scatter that is collected at 90 degree have to do always with the complexity of the granularity of the particle. Um, this is, of course, again, the first kind of the first two parameters that we display when we start an acquisition into cytometer. Now we usually have forward scatter, we have side scatter in linear scale, um, we have some debris that is usually localized below 50. We, play with the gains you know, of the detector to have the cells in a position where we could do a gate and pre-select this first population to the further analysis. And um, what we see here, that's kind of the question that we always have, why, why we don't take right away these guys. And um, with experience, you will see that if you add a viability die, what you will see is that usually the cells that are located in this region of the dot plot are apoptotic cells. So you could immediately start pre-selecting um, live cells just by, by gating. Of course, forward and side discard does not release you of the use of uh, a viability dye. Please always use them because dead cells will also be located inside this gate. Uh, a bit more about forward and side. Forward is not only, only influenced by the size of the particle and side discard is not always totally related to the complexity of the particle. I think this idea came early uh, in the earliest time where, where we were using cytometry to characterize cells in the blood, right? 
because if you think about it, it just fits perfect in the blood, no? So you have this is a profile of blood cells without any kind of antibody. They are just kind of grouped or, or yeah, localized into the dot plot by the feature of the forward and side scattered signals. And if you see here, you have uh, the lymphocyte that are actually monoclonal cells, only one nuclei, very small ones. So they are low in side scatter and also low in forward. Then you have the monocyte that are actually bigger in size uh, than the lymphocyte and a bit more complex. And then what you have here usually are the granulocyte or sometimes also mast cells that are super the kind of the champions of forward and, and side signal, especially side, side scatter since they have the polymorphonuclear, right? They have several nuclei and they are extremely complex when it comes to intracellular uh, content. So they have primary, secondary, tertiary granule protein that make them really complex when it comes to its composition. Um, it's, it's just something to keep in mind. If you, could, you could also have, for example, beads that are really small in size, uh, but they are located see here with very high forward. And it's not, nothing related to the size, but it's more related to the density of the particle that then will scatter light in total different pattern. Um, I will continue now with the part of the optics. So of course, the cytometer will collect this signal that are scattered by a particle. Particle with no fluorescence will always scatter light and give us a forward and side scatter signal. But beside that, from cytometer will also detect fluorescent signal. And this is again happening um, by this cycle of, of excitation emission that, I hap that are happening in this in this interaction between the particle and the laser. Um, so besides collecting foreground side and fluorescent, the cytometer is able to section the light in different part of the spectrum. I just make a very simple cartoon of, of the different section uh, of the light that will be separated in a cytometer. And of course the way uh, the cytometer deal with, with this job of, of portioning the light is by the use of filters. Uh, there are three different kind of filters that are widely used in, in all cytometers and actually also in cell sorters. Uh, one are the short pass filter that basically select the light below a value of the filter. You know, in this case, only whatever is below 500 nanometers will pass the filter. We have a pan pass that basically filter or just allow the passage of a section of the light. In this case, this will be, yeah around 500 wavelength, and we have long passes that then just pass, allow the passage of the uh, light that is above this value, that is in this case, 500. Mm, cytometers are able to measure multiple sections of light in a simultaneous manner. So if we have, for example, the mission of a particle, what we could usually have in a cytometer is a uh, different set of filter organized. So then collect this to filter and collect the light or, or to kind of address this light to a given detector. Uh, but the way I have to say now before I forgot that detector are usually, I mean, they, they, they could not decide anything about what they measure, right? They are just sensing photons arriving all the time. And what is actually deciding the kind of light that is measured by a given detector is the filter that is in most of the cases positioned in front of the detector. So what we have here is the lights coming. We have a long, long pass of 550 that will allow the passage of the light above 550. And then this light will then encounter a band pass and then we decide, okay, the only light passing through this filter is around, mm, that will be, so if you divide this 42 into, then you will have 21. And then you subtract this 21 out of this value, you subtract and also put it on top, so you will have something like 570 to 595. And then this light will pass the band pass and then you reach the detector. And in a simultaneous manner, the light that is below 550 will then encounter another band pass. This one is a very narrow one, 520, that will give light between 5 and 530 nanometer. And this light will then filter and reach this detector. Uh, filters, long passes or, or short, Pass filter can use it to generate light in the same outcome. No, um, so it doesn't matter if you go 
light goes first to one detector and to another one. In this case, you know, the light reaching the detector one is the one above 550 and the one reaching detector two is the one below. Uh, this is a very simplified scheme and I'm sure you should be familiar with this kind of devices of display. Because in, in an instrument, it looks more or less like these. If you have, you know, just by curiosity open um, an instrument or just have a look, you will see that the detector are organized, at least with the instrument are organized in, in a way that you have trigons, so three detectors. In this case, this trigon is associated to a red laser. And you have something named octagon in which you actually have a detector all places in the same, same space. And it's actually a very efficient way to connect light. And if you, I will try to go slowly, let's see if you can follow the arrow. But basically, uh, the photos are coming by an optical fiber here. You see, they enter. And the first light that is getting collected is the one with longer wavelength. So we assume that longer wavelength has less energy. So if the first light that is collected, in this case, we will first collect in the detector A in a range of 300, 780 or 60, we call first this light. And whatever is below 750 will then arrive to the second long pass. This one will filter the light, whatever is above 685 will pass and whatever is below will be reflected. So in, in this way, we kind of use, um, it's, it's efficiency if you think in terms of space, no, you have you have a detector all places in a small device as, as an actor. Um, now I think till here, I hope I managed to explain a little bit about optics and optics of a system. Um, but of course, now it's becoming uh, the tricky question of how we convert this photon or these lights into a signal that we can actually read in, into a computer. Right, and, and the answer for this question is electronics. So this is just, again, a very simple summary of how things are getting processed after. I will try to go bit by bit over the different components. What we have here, it's basically photons arriving into a photomultiplier tube or detector. Uh, what we get out of this interaction or when the photons goes into the detector the PMT will then generate an electric current that goes into the amplifier or pre-amplifier. The amplifier generates a voltage pool, and the voltage pool is, is measured by the ADC, by analog to digital converter, to generate a digital number that then is displaced into a computer. It's, of course, a very simplified way to explain it. And I will go to kind of the critical parts um, involved in this, in this process. So what we have here is then the cells getting better by a laser and these photons goes into the PMT. Um, basically the photons are right inside the PMT and there they are converted into a proportional number of um, electrons that at the end generate an electric current. That's how a photomultiplier looks like. We call it PMTs or multiplier tubes because they're actually tubes. Again, I don't know if you have seen them, but they are just black tubes. They have a small window uh, that you also see here in the cartoon and photons comes out through this uh, window. They pass the photocathode. And at this point, photons are converted into electrons. We, we don't talk anymore about photons now. We are talking about electrons. The electrons are then addressed to these electrodes or dynodes. And then the signal is amplified. So, so these photons, these plates are also loaded with electrons. So these, these electrons excite these electrons here and then amplify the signal. And in every step, there is like a cascade of amplification of the signal that then is collected into the anode uh, and is generate um, a current, right? And the magnitude of this current is proportional to the number of photons that enter the plate. It will of course apply a voltage to this uh, to this PMT, and it's, it sounds that it's something far away. Or you don't get to know about what is happening, but you actually know when, when you are doing setting up your experiment. What you have in in this uh, tab of cytometer, you have all the different parameters names, no? and then you have a value, and this is the value you change. 
when you are, for example, running your negative control and you see all this look very high in the fixed channel, let's put down the voltage. And this is the value, this is the voltage that is applied to this photomultiplier tube. So it's not so far away from what you are doing directly in the software, in the acquisition software. Uh, once uh, you generate this, this electric current, this goes into amplifier and it generates a voltage pulse. And I think we have, we should be more familiar with the voltage pulse. Uh, we talk about a lot about the pulse. And basically what we have here is how the pulse generates. We have the beam in blue and we have a particle. So there is no interaction between the particle and the beam. But at some point the, the cells get into the beam. Because by the way, no, the laser are fixed on the cell or the particle goes into the beam. So once the cells start entering into the beam, there is an initiation of the signal. Once the cell is fully illuminated by the beam, we have like a peak of the pulse. And once the cell leaves the beam, uh, then there is a termination of this pulse. Uh, the magnitude of the pulse depends on different things. One of the factors are, of course, the antigen density. So what you can see here is the different pulses that I generate, but by a particle having a different level of expression. Let's imagine this is something that is very low expressed, like something like CD25 in non-activated cells, then we have very few protein, but once cells get activated, they upregulate the protein in surface. If we label this protein with an antibody, then what we have is a lot of signal. And of course, this pulse and the magnitude of the pulse depend of, of the density of this antigen present there. And also is depending on the brightness of the fluorocombs. Um, and this is really important uh, because when you start doing panel design, that's one of the things that you always take into account. You always play with you know, antigen that are low, that are expressing a very low level. And you usually match this low express, express antigen with very bright fluorocombs, you know? to amplify the detection. But if you have something that is highly expressed, then you don't need to use something very bright, right? Then you could put something that is a dim fluorochrome or a dim dye, because you don't need more. And this is kind of the classical thing that you do with panel design. I could put just a simple example. Um, so an antigen are just expressed on off. You have it, you have a negative from a positive and the seed, no? One, Classical example is CD4 and CD8 antigen in T cells. So you don't need something very bright to detect whatever is CD4 positive. You probably a fixie or an Alexa 488 and dye will do the job perfectly. But when it comes to very tricky antigen, antigen that are you know expressed at a very low level on a very low frequency, then what we want to push is a fluorochrome that could push the signal. So in this case, you will probably couple. Uh, you will use an antibody that is coupled to something like, I don't know, uh, maybe PE, APC, or BB421, something that is very bright. Um, so coming back to, to the subject, um, that is the pulse and how it's generated, this, this pulse is also proportional to the density of the signal. Um, there is something else when it comes to measure the signal and it's the threshold. We usually have a default threshold in the instrument, which usually in the side is covered. And once the detector are measuring, there is there is also a lot of noise that is coming to the detector when there is no no pass, no no not cell passing through the beam. So basically you could set up a threshold in which you kind of tell the instrument what should be considered a real signal and what is just below and it corresponds to the noise of the detector itself. Mm. As particle flow through the cytometer, electrical pulses are generally one of the other one. And to avoid this background of noise, you could apply a threshold to blind the instrument against this sample relate what instrument causes uh, noise that we call electronic noise. So in this case, you have to be very careful not to set up a very high threshold because whatever is below this threshold won't be seen by the instrument. So it won't be seen by the instrument, it won't be recorded. So it, if it won't be appear there. And it's also happening when you do, for example, cell sorting. Um, when people, for example, label blood cells, usually we put uh, CD45, that is an antigen expressed in all hematopoietic cells. So we usually have some debris from erythrocytes, even if we do um, lysis of the blood cells. 
what we usually put is we put the CD45 and we try to do a threshold basis in this CD45 to then avoid this noise into the, into the instrument. Then we could only focus analysis on the CD45 positive cells. And for sertraline, it's a bit more tricky. For analysis, it is not. If you cut very high, then you don't get to record any noise in, into your data. But when it comes to sorting, you need to be careful not to set up a very high threshold because if you make the instrument blind to this, blind to this threshold, you don't, the instrument won't see it. So the dot will look very nice, very clean, but the, if the instrument could not see this particle, then it could not discriminate. So you will probably sort you know, your cells with, with a lot of debris of oil contaminants. So you have to be very careful when it comes to salvaging a threshold, if it is for flow cytometry, flow cytometric analysis, or when it comes to cell sorting. Um, so once you have generated these voltage, voltage pools, uh, we need to measure these voltage pools, right? I mean, the cytometer need to, to measure these pools. And what we measure about these pools is three different things. One is the area of the pools, it's, uh, the width of the pools and also the height. And we understand the height, like the maximal amount of signal coming from a particle illuminated by a laser. The area will give us kind of the integral of the pools and the width is related to the time the cell takes to cross the laser beam. Um, and again, it, it sounds like something far away, but again, if you have a look on your cytometer tab, you will see a list of parameters and you will see like letter A width and height, age, and you could click. Usually fluorescent is measured in area, but if you want, for example, to discriminate between singles and doublets, then you will probably put height and width. And this is something you click directly into the acquisition software. So it's not so far away of a practical things happening to the cytometry. And now that we know what is the thing that we measure of, of the pools, we need to know how the cytometer actually measure that. And this is happening in what we call the ADC, the analog to digital converter. And in, in this part of the, the system, we measure um, and we generate a digital value, but it's progressively. So it's not like you just measure the pools in one shot, it's actually broken down the signal into small slices that you could see here in small sections. And it, it's doing what we call sampling. It's at a given time measuring the signal at this point, at this point, at this point, at different point of the pools itself. And then, uh, then all together, this, this, this data is a storage and it's assigned a digital value. Also, uh, Samples of the pools are captured at the instant of time and all together stored um, as a digital value. So that's how it's happening into the system. Mm, the digital value is assigned to a beam or channel depending on actually the resolution of the ADC. This part is always a bit tricky to explain, but basically uh, the ADC have different kind of resolution. Most of them are two exponential 18, so you have more like 250k small beams, so small section in which the data could be placed. And you see, for example, here it's just a pulse that is getting placed into a different beam depending of, of the intensity of the pulse. Uh, beams are just labels in which the data can be placed into. Uh, and then what the cytometer will generate at the end is actually a very nice table of values. For every parameter, you will have account like a list of events da, 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 and the different values of the different parameters that the cytometry is measured. Um, and thankfully we don't see this kind of value in the cytometer, but what we actually see is a graph that then shows the position of, of this event in, into an histogram or a dot plot and if this event is then placed into a channel or a beam. Mm. Then we, of course, visualize the data as histograms or dot plot. And histogram has only one parameter and what we call the relative cell number. And we have here that is negative population, intermediate and high. And when it comes to dot plot, then we have two parameters. One here, in this case, PE and FIXI. And if we divide these in, in quadrants, then we will see that in this region, we have cells that do not express any of the three chlorograms, 
We have shown that are single positive for PE, single positive for FITSI, and other ones that are double positive for expression of, of both. Um, I hope till here I kind of managed to explain um, the full process of, of this electronic part. Um, that is something else I would like to just introduce a little bit here, especially for people that is, um, is starting in psychometry. We, I think for several years, we kind of get used to display data only in histograms and dot plots. Uh, and it was also because we were having this small parameter. We have, I don't know, five parameters, I think with 20 dot plots, you kind of cover one parameter against the other one. But as dice start evolving and also the amount of parameters that we start evaluating into a single um, experiment or single assay, start you know growing, growing, then then we got the necessity or, or the need to display data in different ways. So right now this is just only post-acquisition analysis. But now there is another way to display data. Uh, this is a classical dimensional reduction TSME plot in which many, many parameters are now summarizing only two. And basically what we see is cluster of different population. We also have clustering uh, tools uh, like a spade and flowsome that's um, becoming really, really popular and very useful. And what we have here is clustering of cells. Um, and we could actually have color codes in which we see the intensity of one marker expressed for example, in the B cells. So it's, it's just a kind of a small introduction of the thing that could be done and with, with all this big data that we are now producing. So please don't get stuck into, into dot plot, go a bit farther. These things are were in the past only available in some programs like R that of course require a lot of expertise you know, to handle. But right now, thanks to, to BD and Flowio, these kind of tools are available as a plugins into the flow software. And um, there is a lot of material. I don't want to do marketing, but it's really amazing. Um, you have a lot of supporting material in, in flow your webpage that have you know like tutorials, tons of videos on how to use in all of these in clustering and uh, dimensional reduction tools to then um, display your data. Um, Back, and we'll come back a bit to the data generation or how to play, you know, with this feature of the pools. Um, you can use, you know, this information from the pools, from the, from the pools to, for example, split doublets and singlets. And what we have here, you remember, I was mentioning that the wheat uh, speak about the time the part that will take to cross the beam. So we assume if this is the laser, the particle we cross in a bay around part, we, we generate the pools like this. You know, with a given value of the width, but if you have two cells that are together, uh, the width will be wider, right? Because this this complex of two cells will take longer to cross the full beam, so the width will always be higher, and also the area. It's possible that height is always the same, but area will also be bigger when it comes to a doublet. So then you will play with this kind of feature of the pools to exclude it. In your analysis. Mm, I think when I started with cytometry, my PhD, that was probably 20 years ago, that was not that common. I, I remember we were not using much these, these things about singles and doubles. We were not using a lot of variability dyes. Well, it, I guess it's also has to do with you know, the limitation of the instrument itself, because before we have probably instrument uh, detecting two or three channels. Uh, but now we have, you know, like a range of instruments with 20, 30, 40 uh, parameters that could be measured. Then we could try to put dyes to improve in the detection of, of the cells. So what I have here, it's again for one side scatter. I have to put all the cells here, including this one. And if I put width against area, it's easy to see that it's a population that has a higher width in the side. And then what you need to do then is to exclude this. Uh, this guy is this population. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take um, some questions. I just have to go very soon because I'm myself attending um, a course, but I will be happy to, to get some questions if there are some, or if you are just uh, written by email, I, I guess I will just share it.